Welcome to Running on Ice, the coolest community in freight. I'm your host, Mary O'Connell, bringing you the latest tech updates, warehouse news, and everything happening in the cold chain world. Not only is there the coolest show in freight, but there's also Running on Ice, the newsletter that could not be colder. You can subscribe to that on freightwaves.com slash running on ice. Today, we are joined by Bruno Jacktel, co-founder and CEO of Hypercell Technologies. Thank you so much for coming to the show, Bruno. Well, thank you, Mary, for having me. Uh, so before we jump into something that's a little different today, Let's get some background on you and kind of why you started Hypercell. Um, I'm a veterinarian by training, um, and I have been uh, involved in food safety all my life. Uh, what triggered really the creation of Hypercell was the famous uh, issue with uh, Chipotle when they had to uh, recall uh, and, and close some stores because of food safety issues. They lost uh, 30% of their uh, of their value just because they could not figure it out what was uh, the cause of the people's uh, sickness. It took them f f five days to get the results, and I thought there should be a better way to identify pathogen in the food chain. The idea started, uh, but it took me uh, some time just to figure it out how to make it work uh, and how to get to uh, the market and to the food safety chain on a system, on a test that would be more rapid, but also as accurate as what we have, but with results really in a few hours instead of a few days. So kind of like everyone that's had a great idea and uh, it's relied on science, you've had to trust, you know, you've had to trust lady science to consistently provide the same results over and over again. Yes, exactly. So I guess uh, for those who might not be familiar with Hypercell, um, you guys have a point of like a rapid point of care diagnostic thing. So kind of how is that different from um, traditional uh, applications of, you know, testing something on the floor or testing something to see if it contains, you know, the comments like listeria or any of those other kind of pathogens? How does the rapid point of care one differ from the traditional way that it's done now? Uh, let, let me just uh, uh, frame a little bit our uh, what we're doing today. Uh, still in 20, you know, uh, 2023, uh, there are one out of six Americans who suffer every year from foodborne diseases. And this number has not gone down from the past 20 years, even with all the technology improvements and all the new protocols. And one of the reasons, and to answer your question, is that today the testing for pathogen contamination is not adequate you always have to choose and make a compromise. Either you can use the uh, really act, uh, rapid test that you can do in the food plants directly, but these tests are not accurate. Uh, they don't give the right uh, the result that you need to avoid uh, con the, uh, putting into market a product that are contaminated. If you want to have accurate tests that would give you the real, the answer you need, they are very slow because you still have to uh, sample, prepare the sample, ship them, go to your lab, and then get the results back. And it's a, it's a little bit like the situation we had with COVID. Unfortunately, we all know what it what is about, where you have these rapid tests that you can do at home, but if you remember, we had to do it over and over again because they would not be accurate enough. So we had to do several of them, or. The other option was to uh, use the PCR technology. Now everybody knows what PCR means, but you had to take a sample, send it to your lab, and wait a few days to get the results. Uh, today, the food chain uh, moves too fast to uh, avoid waiting for results, but if, if you use the rapid test, it's not accurate enough. So the idea was to uh, put together a new technology that would be as quick as the you know, rapid test, but as accurate as the PCR. So you don't have to compromise between uh, rapid and accuracy. And also the important thing, the uh, main, uh, our main uh, focus was to be able to do the test uh, in the premises, directly at the food plant, or directly in the uh, production facilities that would, uh, you know, of uh, po uh, swine farms or poultry farms uh, all, all the way down the food chain 
from the farm down to restaurant. And one day, maybe we'll be able to uh, propose to Chipotle, uh, you know, the tear that they can do in some of the restaurants. I like it bringing the answers to people before they have to, you know, get people sick or do a ma major recall and then spend a lot of time doing some uh, PR work to get back on the good side of everything. Um, I guess, so when you say that this can be done at like the production facility, does it have to be by like a qualified like a biologist or can it just be done by anyone that maybe like the warehouse manager or the shift lead who can just go around and collect the samples and run the tests? So let's say it's a, it's really uh, a very uh, specific uh, objective that we have. And that's why our company is a little bit uh, different from uh, everybody else. I think the market is moving to today towards more sophisticated uh, tests and more, uh, you know, uh, using very sophisticated technology like new generation uh, sequencing or CRISPR, but all of that has to be done in a lab. Our, our vision is to decentralize and to do the test directly at the manufacturing plants. So in order to, and to give the power to the customers to do whatever they need to do to improve their uh, food safety and to understand exactly what's going on in their processing system. So in order to do that, we had to go completely the other way, which was keep the accuracy, keep the uh, very uh, precise technology, but make it simple. So how, how did we do that? We had, so that's really the innovation. We, uh, and we are uh, innovating all the way to, uh, from taking, how do you take a sample? How do you treat the sample? And how do you uh, do the reaction? And how do you read it? So today, just an example, a PCR test typically takes between 15 to 18 steps and it requires equipment. It requires to transfer liquid from one tube to another. That's why you cannot do it in the premise. You have to go in the lab with a very high trained technician. So if you take that system and our system is completely different. We move from 12 steps to three steps. You don't need equipment. You don't need to transfer uh, liquid from one tube to another with a pipette. You don't need a very expensive thermocycler, you know, 50,000, 100,000 dollar equipment. And you can, it can be done by uh, the lab tech who is, uh, who is doing right away, I mean, right, or, already the sampling um, uh, this, um, you know, protocol. And the way we tested it, we went to a big farm, which is probably one of the most difficult environment to deal with to get a very accurate, you know, testing system. And we asked the people who worked at the farm to do the test themselves. And that's how we validate the fact that we were able to identify the virus from a very dirty sample in a very, uh, let's say crude environment. And where the people who were working there without uh, need, you know, with no, tra uh, no training. Uh, that's how we think we're going to change the paradigm today of how you do the testing. It will be done uh, at the premises. You get the results in less than an hour with the level of accuracy of a very sophisticated technology, but in a very simple protocol. And the, and the equipment is just a reader, very, very simple, uh, very affordable. And that's uh, our, you know, new, um, the way we see how the, the uh, testing is going to go in the future. I really like that because obviously there is um, little to no comparisons that can be made between a pig farm and a lab lab and levels of, you know, cleanliness just in any way, shape or form. There's very little comparisons between the two, but it's nice that you know, this, this, this technology can work just with, you know, if I were to step in there one day and say, Hey, you know, I want, I'm gonna, I'm the new person on the block. My job is going to be testing these samples for pathogens. Um, you know, 
this is I'm just gonna like take the training and do it and then I can suddenly do it and you don't have to have a doctorate of infectious diseases to come work on staff because that's not very achievable for most companies um I kind of like this because also like you mentioned there's not um you just need a reader which is significantly cheaper than a whole machine and a whole lab that you would need to get all this testing done um it's just it's just so much more approachable and i think it's easier for people to get in on it and the reward and like the long-term reward of you know not sending out infected meat that's that's pretty that's pretty high return on investment yeah, I would say I would say when I look at uh, today is more um, what's the benefit for the customers because you can talk about technology uh, for a long time, but what's important is the users. What's the benefit? What are they taking out of the uh, what we are offering them? And here I can give you some examples and uh, how a rapid test but accurate uh, will provide uh, very direct benefits. Uh, one example, yeah, yeah. Take, take an example. We, we are working right now with a company that does fresh food and their shelf life is seven days. But in order to uh, uh, put the, the food on the market, they have to test and it takes one day for them to wait until they get the PCR results. So it's one day out of seven that they are losing because they have to wait for the uh, results. If we give them the results in an hour, they gain a day of shelf life which means that right away it's 15% of uh, revenue uh, in addition to what they have already. So it's a direct a direct gain. Um, second, um, today there, is n there are no uh, preventative uh, testing done before going to meatpacking. Um, therefore, they, uh, the meatpackers don't know when they receive like uh, pigs or hogs if they are infected or not because they cannot wait. Uh, they put them in the pens before going into the processing plant, but they cannot wait a day to keep the, the pigs there and say, oh, are, are they uh, are contaminated or not? So our technology will allow them to know exactly which pens are contaminated or not, and then manage their, their chain in a better way uh, by having the uh, clean, let's say the non-contaminated uh, pigs going first, having the contaminated pigs going after, and their meat being treated as uh, cooked uh, products other than instead of raw products, which would reduce dramatically the risk of food contamination and also recalls. So this is another example. Um, another, let's say another example I can give you is if there is a suspicion of contamination in, a f in the food plant. Uh, that area that uh, has been uh, you know, tested and potentially contaminated um, is uh, not used, is locked down until you can requalify. And requalify means that you need to do three tests, three negative consecutive tests to show that now you have cleaned the area and then everything is fine. Each test if, if each test takes two days to get results from a PCR lab, it's going to take six days for you to requalify that specific area of production. Instead of waiting six days, if you get the results in one day, you gain already uh, a lot of productivity in your food chain. Yeah, that would be, that's actually like a game changer because not only you know, do you have to clean, you have to stop, shut, shut down production to clean everything, then at the earliest that you're looking at six days to get back up and running, that's at the earliest. That's not assuming that, you know, it doesn't, somebody doesn't come pick it up or they don't get a sample done or, you know, they get a negative test in there. Um, that is, that is absolutely game changing because again, it's not sending out, it's not allowing any contaminated product to be sent out. It's not, um, it's, it's, you know, you're cutting down on, on the time that your operations are down. And then also, you know, you don't have to deal with the, the PR nightmare that is a, a recall and other problems like that. So today, let's say the situation today is that of operators, which are not doing enough testing because as you see some of, because of the time it takes to get results, it's not even, uh, useful to do this test. So they don't do enough testing. And also the test uh, 
uh, come back later. The products are already gone. So they, they run what we call blind and behind. Everything is behind. And the recall is just a reactive action against uh, contamination. So with our test, we change that from being blind and behind to be aware and active. Aware because you can do more testing and all along the food chain. And active because once you have the results, you can stop the product right away without before you have to to recall it. So you you do proactive um, measures. So now let's say imagine that you are a big producer of of meat, which which uh, integrates from the production of animal all the way down to shipping to retail. Um, these massive operations have several. Uh, pig farm, like they have tens of pig farms. Then they have trucks, and then they have slaughterhouses, and then they have meat packing plants in a country. So with this testing, uh, and our um, your readers, our readers are all connected to the cloud, so you can get the results on your phone or on your computer. So by putting these tests and these readers everywhere on the food chain, we allow the person responsible for QA or food safety to suddenly have a map on his or her computer and to see exactly uh, in real time where contamination occurs, uh, in which geography, in which part of the manufacturing process, and act immediately uh, to improve the, the, um, the uh, flow of contamin potentially contaminated either animal or food stop it and redirect you know the food chain to avoid you know contaminating the entire chain and this is also a tool that we are designing through a SaaS, you know it's a com com uh, you know computer program that you can you know use on the cloud that would allow directly the operator to own the data and to validate the di data to be able to understand what's going on to have some epidemiological evidence, and then to fix the weak points in the chain to improve continuously the process. So it's a powerful um, tool because it's not only one test, but it's hundreds of tests a day uh, that you get on your computer with the results and when, with an understanding and a better vision of what's going on in the entire operation. I absolutely love that because like you said, it gives that person that visibility into where things are going wrong and where the m most common point of contamination is. Like if I know that everything that comes out of Colorado is great, except this one specific spot, well, what's happening at this one spot that lets me go dive deeper into it and see, well, okay, is it something at that is at that at that that um, that production facility? Is it something at that warehouse? Like, what is going on? And it really stops. Um, it's another level of safety to stop everything from you know going bad and potentially harming a lot of people. So I absolutely love that it's that the, it brings that like visibility to that part of things. Exactly. I mean, that's the way we we design you know our new testing system, uh, which is. You know, doing doing directly, you know, giving the power and giving the information to the operators, giving them the uh, ability to get more information about what, what's going on, giving them very accurate information, giving affordable testing. I mean, if you look at the volume that the tests, uh, you know, every day that's uh, that are sent to a lab uh, through a PCR. Uh, which costs, you know, a lot of money. So this is also much more affordable and gives the power directly to the, not not leave the power at the lab d done by the uh, diagnostic company. What we want is to give that um, data, to give all the information to the producers who can uh, analyze them and understand and improve their system to avoid the recalls. A recall, a recall today the average cost is around $10 million. And also it has a major impact on the brand. We still remember all the recalls. We still remember the Tylenol. We still remember the Chipotle. We still remember uh, all these, these uh, 
contaminations, which have a direct impact on how people perceive the brand and the trust they have in the brand. It's got to be at least worth over $10 million of the damaged reputation and all of that. Because like you said, we still remember the Chipotle thing. We still remember the Chipotle chicken. We never forget. Yes, exactly. It keeps uh, so we we want to move. Comp- we want to change the uh, you know the how people address. We want to give them uh, eyes. We want to give them uh, information uh, to be able to improve and to uh, avoid uh, the recalls and the contamination. We need to get these numbers down. We need to get the number of people sick with Salmonella, E. coli, Listeria down. And what you see on the contrary today is an increase of contamination, uh, and that's linked to the way we work today. So one is uh, much you know, more processed food, which increases the risk of contamination. Second, a supply chain that is more international, so movements of uh, you know, uh, goods and animals and prepared food, which also increases the risk of contamination. Um, and uh, also the fact that you know, the, the numbers, uh, the volume also is increasing with growing population. So all these factors are moving towards increasing the risk of contamination. Uh, and in order to factor that and to reduce the potential risk, we have to have new tools. We have to have some innovation in the market. I mean, personally, as a consumer, I'm very excited about the prospect of food contaminants going down and people getting sick down. Um, because as someone who has definitely had salmonella before, it's not fun. It's not great. It's pretty miserable. Um, but yeah, I am I am completely here for it, and I can't wait to see um, the results in a couple of years when people start adopting this new technology. And hopefully, that or I would imagine that a number of people getting sick would dramatically fall because we don't we don't need that. Yes, that that's our that's our goal. And we are already, let's say, we are already working with some of the biggest uh, food operators in the, in the country and even in the world who are very interested in uh, looking at the technology. We're still in the early stage of the development, but even at that stage, uh, these big conglomerates are really interested in looking at how they can implement some of them say, "Well, when are you ready? You know, we need the product. We need your technology right away. We would love to test it. We'd love to use it." Um, so we are in a in a very uh, interesting position where uh, we have a validated technology, and also we have you know big potential partners uh, who are willing to integrate that technology into their system because they see they see the immediate benefits. That is insanely amazing. Um, That being said, we are running out of time today, but there is a question that everyone that comes on the show that does have to answer. Um, And so let's assume that nothing is contaminated in this scenario. But if you had, or if you, let me get my words together. Do you think that cereal is considered a soup? I I don't think so. (laughs) (laughs) I don't think so either, but... No, 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 no way. Cereal is, is too is too precious. It's what I eat every every morning. But I make my own, uh, my own meal with a lot of fruit and a lot of uh, uh, fiber and all that. So I love it. I am a good. I'm a strong cereal girl as well. So it is not soup. It is its own category entirely. Like when you go to the grocery store, you don't see cereal boxes next to cans of soup. It's just, it's not the same. If anyone wants to reach out to you about this diagnostic testing or your thoughts on cereal, uh, where can they find you outside the show? Yes, uh, we, we can, they can um, you know, look at our website, which is uh, www.hypercelltech.com um, or, or directly uh, contact me on LinkedIn. Awesome. You guys heard it here first. Bruno's basically said that his DMs are open. Uh, <laughs> but thank you so much for joining us today. No, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. You can catch other episodes of Running on Ice right here on YouTube or anywhere else you get your podcasts like Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Need more Running on Ice news? No sweat. Subscribe to the newsletter on FreightWaves.com slash Running on Ice. See you on the internet. Mm-hmm.